Even when I concentrate, oh, I still don't have a yeah. gavel, but we are, I think, <laughs> virtual gavel. Oh, yeah. We are going to call the order for the August 14th, oh, yeah. August 14th oh. meeting of the Civil Service hey Merit Board. Yeah. So we'll start by calling the roll. Jay Roberts. Present. Art Dukes. Present. Stephanie Taylor. Present. Scott Schimmel. Present. And I'm Bill Lyons, and I'm obviously present. Uh, so the first item is the approval of the minutes of the meeting that was held on July 10th, 2024. Motion. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Not usually much. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the minutes indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no? The minutes are approved. Okay, then we have uh, reports regarding litigation. Mr. Winchester. Nothing to report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Shields. Nothing this month, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, okay, and now we have the staff report for civil service. Sure. Um, you guys should all have okay. in the pockets. You should have gotten it in your packet, but there's also a hard copy in your pocket. This was something that Jane had asked for at the last meeting. Um, it's just sort of, this is what I interpreted her request to be, so if this isn't quite right, let me know. Um, but it's basically our, how our budget works, um, so just sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, ours is not as complex as some, and it's driven by certain line items, so just highlighting that for you guys. Do you need me to expand on that at all? It's pretty, it's pretty basic, pretty self-explanatory. Sure. Does she have any questions on that before I move on? Okay. Um, I do appreciate you giving us all this too and uh, continuing to provide us with these even more detailed things prepping us for next person. So thank you. Um, I was just, so I'm, I'm still relatively new to all of this, right? Yes, maybe not. <laughs> um, I did want to just kind of review like the lines. So, so I, my original question was just kind of understanding the budgets set for like legal outside counsel, litigation expenses, and uh, what that looks like. And I did have that, I guess, highlighted in here. So let's see. So for our legal outside counsel, that is basically is that, that is part of what we do for Mr. Winchester for the board, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the copy I sent you electronically had the, the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, if you're you're here, so we do yeah. have those somewhere. Okay. Just not on this piece of paper. So um, I just was a little curious about that. Um, so I noticed like just for the budget for this year, so that's how much again do we have to decide? I think it might be cut off. Yeah, I was, that's why I was saying those amounts got cut off on the printed. Oh, okay. You do have them on the email. Sure. Copy. Um, but it looks like they got cut off when she printed these. Okay. Um, so I almost know them, almost. Okay. They won't be precise. They'll be ballpark. Okay. So ballpark. <laughs> Ballpark just for that legal outside counsel. I think I saw sixty thousand dollars a year. Is that right? right now, that's what's in that account. And keep in mind that when we set the budget, and this is why I type this up for whoever, because it'll be somebody else doing it next time. Um, finance gives us the bottom line, and we simply allocate that bottom line to various accounts, and those are the ones that are highlighted here. So anything you see highlighted, those are the only accounts we can manipulate. The others are fixed. Um, they're fixed by the city. So it's going to be like our rent, um, anything there's, the city has a contract for that we don't control. Um, and of those that are highlighted, the majority are sort of small operating accounts, uh, office supplies. My staff will tell you I don't buy furniture. You come in my office, you will see my busted chair. <laughs> we just don't. Um, but we have to keep a small amount in there if something is really needed, like a new a new desk chair. Um, but if you needed something more than minimal office furniture, obviously that would then be what's called a supplemental request. So 
We have small amounts in those items because they're just not accounts that we spend a lot out of. Um, four items pretty well drive the majority of our budget. And those, unfortunately, the professional services, we can typically come very close to estimating what that amount is going to be because we usually know approximately what we're going to be purchasing in exam services the following year. That's always going, the reason you see that twice um, on this particular printout, and I believe they've rolled them together at this point. We had a separate line item for that um, e-skill, which is our online uh, exam service that allows us to uh, have the test data bank, build the exams, and administer the exams online. So that one is 12.5. Um, the remainder of the professional services is anything we expect to purchase with regard to testing, typically. Um, because we're not currently purchasing entry level police exams, there's a savings there. Um, so we're kind of, I had, I still had the money um, budgeted because it's just always rolled each year to about the same amount. Um, purchasing entry level exams for police, which we're not currently doing, and uh, eliminating that in basket exam, which was really expensive, just to be honest, they were $500 an exam. Um, that money was still in there this year, so that is what we're actually using to pay to update our supervisory exams in fire. Uh, they like to change out their questions every year, so we replace about 25% of our fire supervisory exams every year so that there's different content each year, it's not the same. And we have to pay our contractor to do that. Um, as well as developing new oral boards. And with the oral boards, I went ahead and took an extra step, it cost a little more, but it will eliminate someone having to redo this again in a year or two years. Um, we're actually having them create an excess of questions. Uh, we need five questions for an oral board, and we're actually having them create five additional questions so that one to two can be traded out each year so that the oral board is never exactly the same. And that bank of 10 questions can be used for a while. Uh, you know, I can't say how long before someone feels like we need to replace those, but you're gonna at least get, um, you know, I would say three to five years out of that set of questions without having to redo anything. So uh, we're using that money, that's what we're using it for this year. And then obviously we anticipate purchasing fire exams um, for entry-level fire, but we never know. So where unexpected expenses might come into that line item is if a department asked us to develop an exam that we weren't prepared to develop um, and that we had to hire a consultant to do or purchase an exam that we didn't anticipate needing to purchase. So you may have some unexpected expenses in that account, but we can typically pretty well guess what we're gonna use there. So we always have a little excess in there just to cover those unanticipated costs. Litigation expenses um, are completely unpredictable. Sure. Um, I went back just curious, um, because I, I typically would just look back a couple of years to establish what should go in that account. And we have historically, without wavering, averaged about three hearings a year. And that cost, depending on the hearing, can be anywhere from about $1,000 to about $10,000. And that's where it starts to become less predictable. You don't know how long the hearing is gonna last. You don't know how many witnesses, if it's a multiple, you know, 20 witnesses in a four day hearing, that's gonna be significantly more expensive than a hearing that lasts two hours uh, and is done by Zoom. So those become less and less predictable. Um, and the volume this year is extraordinary. We have already used that entire budget, and it's honest. <laughs> it's, that budget is gone. So we've averaged three hearings a year forever. Um, and so there's always been about $20,000 estimated for that. We've already gone through that. And we're, we're still, we've still got, I've got it on, I want to say we have four, we have four pending right now, four active, that we haven't even gotten a bill for yet. So, 
that one is difficult. You, you simply can't. And I will say credit to the administration. They know that. Um, and finance is always agreeable to work with us on that. And it's the same with legal outside counsel. The only things we know, Mr. Winchester, or whoever your counsel is, if he ever retires and he decides to go, um, I hope he doesn't. But if he does, whoever that counsel is, the things that you can expect them to do every month are going to be reviewing um, the materials for the board meeting, participating in the board meeting, and if you have a, a rule change and are going to have a public hearing for a rule change, typically your outside counsel would review that. Everything else is unanticipated. It's reactionary. So it's going to be based on needs that come up that you don't know are going to come up. So um, something you need a report on, something you need a legal opinion on. Um, and those are always, almost always going to be reactionary. Um, or it's going to be a change that this board has decided to make that maybe you didn't know you were going to make when the budget was drafted. And it requires legal review or legal input. Um, so those are going to be things that are harder, they're harder to anticipate. So those two legal line items are the ones that are very difficult to anticipate and finance and the administration have always been very gracious um, to first allow us to shift. You can always shift funds from one account to another. If you find you have excess, we typically have excess in most of these smaller accounts because we don't use, we just, I'm cheap and we don't spend a lot. Um, we don't travel, we don't. We just don't do a lot of those things. So we typically have some extra that we can use to cover some of those needs um, if we need to, and finance is really great to work with us on the ones that we can. Um, so, and again, just kind of understanding, so with like relation to the Civil Service Merit Board, um, so I know we have Mr. Winchester here for our you know, outside counsel and prep, and, I understand too from what you've uh, given a memo from that on. Is that something? Um, how, how many years, I guess, have have we done bids for this out? Or he's been here thirty or three? It'll be thirty-four years. Okay. I, I serve at the will of the board. You can. Fire me now. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. I mean, I'm not being tacky about it. I'm just telling you, you know, I've always, I was hired in 1990, uh, and um, I have been working at the direction of the board since then. I say the that board to replace me. It's, it's been so long, I don't know how they chose. I really don't and know. Quite frankly, I've, 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 I've just gone yeah. to council with my firm, so I'm, not retiring, but I'm starting to slow down. So, uh, but I planned on staying on, especially with the new director coming in, because I thought it might be a little bit much to not have someone that has my background in what we do here, and then also have our civil service director on. So that was kind of my plan. It'd be, it's only fair to tell the board this, but. Um, that's up to you whether I stay or go right now. And I would say the process would probably be different than it was in the 90s. I don't know what that, I would, I would suggest that when that time comes that the board, probably the board chair confer with finance and the administration to know what, we may have procurement rules now that we didn't have then, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, because like, I was going to say, yeah. right, David Rice, <laughs> so professional services contracts, mm -hmm. okay, like a licensed attorney, an engineer, an architect, have, have very, very different state required procurement. Okay. And so I think the board, up to a certain amount, can just say, hey, we really, uh, you know, really enjoy Mr. Winchester services and we'd like to use him up to a certain amount. And those thresholds are pretty high because of those licenses. So, but it is clearly up to the board, and they would want to work with finance. And there, there could be a procurement, there could be an RFP, there could be a RFQ again. But the, the purchasing requirements are, you know, you've had 34 years because he's a licensed attorney, and the board has wanted to use him. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay. But that is board discretion. It's board discretion, fully totally board discretion. I mean, you can have a rotation, you can do an RP, whatever you like to do, but professional services, engineers, architects, basically uh, licenses that uh, the state allows or how, how, that can ha how that can happen. I don't know the upper threshold, but I think we're below it. Okay. The, the city also has a code section that was adopted several years ago, many years ago. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and I can check with Charlie Swan, Swanson on this, but it was uh, allowing boards to retain their own counsel. So sometimes I don't represent you. The city's law directors uh, represent you. It depends on what it is uh, and the nature of it, those kind of things. But that's the way it's worked all the years I've been here. Okay. Right. And it, it is, I guess, are we the only board that has our own council and not rather than supplied by the city that breaks as far as you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at, I mean, it's not the same, but like the planning commission has its own outside legal, I mean, they're not, that's a semi-government, it's somewhat comparable, so. Right. But yeah, the most board, you know, the Greenway Commission, the uh, Better Building Board, the, they oftentimes have a representative, like George is here, um, and so, but the, the mayor board has always uh, had Mr. Winchester. Um, well, not always. I haven't been here forever. Though. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been been years. Been years. Long time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just put it this way: there's people in the room that weren't born. When I was <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I've enjoyed. I understand. It. It. Yeah, and, and again, it's one of those things where I've enjoyed. Uh, I think I've served during the tenure of eight mayors. Uh, I've seen a lot of different comings and goings. You know, some of the bigger changes in, in the rating experience, one reason that the attorney's fees are as high as, uh, as they have been over the last several years is because of the significant changes that have occurred. Uh, the charter changes, well, the way the charter changes, uh, the HR department coming along, changes in administrative, there were things that just had to be done. And because uh, I think the, uh, Dr. Hadfield said it correctly, my work is mostly reactionary. It's when you need me to do something. Okay. okay. And it's not, while we're on it, it's not dissimilar to your hearing officers. Sure. Um, so the next, and, and I'm going to suggest you might want to explore adding a hearing officer mm -hmm. in the near future. Um, so again, that just, you know, like David said, that's at your, how you do that is at your discretion. Um, so hearing officers, that's who mostly gets paid out of that um, litigation expense. Okay. That's what that mostly is for. We don't set their rates. We, the historic practice, and this is something you can change. The historic practice has been to seek nominations from existing hearing officers. Um, feeling, I guess the board has always felt like those are the people who know what the role entails and could recommend individuals that would both be interested and qualified. Um, and then the board has selected from those nominated individuals. Um, but they set their rates and they send us a bill. Okay. Um, so right now, we're we are recently down another hearing officer. They're all, well, they've all been with the, our hearing officers other than the two we, you guys just added. Mm, a couple of years ago had been with us for over 30 years oh, wow. and so they are slowly retiring we still have three um, we have three remaining tenured hearing officers but they could retire on us at any time we have Beverly Nelms um, we have Celeste Herbert and we have John Roach those are the three they they've been here longer than I have so I can't say how long they've been hearing officers, um, but since I since I came on, they were here, and we have two that are fairly new. Um, I think they've each maybe had one hearing or two hearings so far, but this year I suspect they'll get they'll get their fill. Um, so uh, again, that's another you know kind of a an unknown piece of that relates to the budget that you guys will have to think of is that's. You're right. really, your, would, your job is to appoint those hearing officers as well. Okay. Yeah, I would just say, so. in my opinion, to speak for myself, it doesn't hurt periodically to review just about everything. Yeah. Say, when, you know, just yeah. it's just healthy because, you know, you have things that uh, continue in every organization I've ever been. That's been the case where sometimes it's 
well, we've done it this way, it really isn't good enough when the, you know, when the environment's changed enough. But I think uh, that's something, especially when, when we get a new executive secretary in place and we'll, you know, have a little time, hopefully without being deluged with things, we might want to appoint a committee or have a committee to hold to kind of just go through and review the practices that we have been doing. And you may want to keep them all, but you know, it doesn't help to have a, a fresh, hurt to have a fresh look at it. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate going through, I know, kind of one of the tedious line item things, but I think it, it's good. Like, I know I'm new-ish to the board, but you're new in the But um, <laughs> I think, um, you, and you've done an excellent job cap capturing all this just institutional knowledge over the years, and same for Mike, um, sharing that with us too. So, like, the fact that I, I think we've been able to rely on that and previous boards has, has been a comfortable thing, but now with retirement or anything coming up, we have to start thinking, I guess, uh, about doing some of these things that we've not had to very, do. I think it's very so, wise. So, yeah. Uh, so, I think just really, um, this is very helpful, but also anything like that over the next couple of months that yeah. we just need to know as a board that, you know, we used to have that handled so smoothly and you know and so um, I guess we gotta learn but we have to put more work yeah. into it, so I did let Jane know that this this kind of brings up something that I've been doing um, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna continue doing because I it did I recognize the same thing that when you have someone who you know, we've just done this on autopilot for so long, and the board has just been able to rely on, well, Mike knows, well, Vicki knows. Um, all of the things that I do, that I'm the one that knows, I'm making, I'm making things like this. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So basically like a budget, so that someone else could come in and, and open this document, say, okay, what am I supposed yeah. to do? And what do I need to know to do that? How does you know, we're lucky that our budget looks like that. I mean, can you imagine a police department kept well, looking at my budget? My budget. Yeah. You know, these 20 items I can move things around. But just explaining what that process is, what time of year you do that, what do you do, who do you need to call if you need help. Um, so I'm doing that on everything I think of that the next person's going to need to know. What is what is our role in? The hiring process from start to finish, from the time a requisition is opened until um, we sign off on that certification form for the new hire. What do we do, and who does it, and how is it done, and what's the time frame? And so everything. What is the certificate? The certification process itself, you would think, is as simple as signing a piece of paper. It's. I wish it was just me and Teresa. Both wish it was just signing a piece of paper. <laughs> It's cumbersome, so making sure I have resources that explain how all of those things are done um, as much as I can, rationale behind why we do certain things the way we do, which things are rooted in something in the charter or rule versus things that are can be changed um, or discretionary. Um, so just I'm making those resources, and I've got I'm I'm. I'm realized it's best to just keep it in an electronic file because it's becoming quite large and unwieldy. I told Jane when I came in, I got a notebook. I was given a literally a paper notebook <laughs> to do my job. She gave me a notebook. But it was helpful. Um, so just some things that person can go to, um, you know, historic documents that are of importance explaining there's this process in place. What is it rooted in so that no one has to reinvent that wheel? And you can say, okay, this is why it's this way. Is this something that, you know, that we can change? Should we change? Um, so just everything I can think of, um, trying to prepare a resource um, to be a guide or training for the next executive center. So if there, are any, if there are other things that you guys would like to know, some you will probably never be intimately involved in. Um, but if it's just things you would like an overview of or would like to know, let me know. Good and thank you. And I'll be the first to say I appreciate so much you giving us prepared information and making this transition as easy as possible. So 
uh, already pre appreciate everything you've given today. You know, Miss Sana too, like you said, all the tasks and things. So uh, uh, it's very beneficial. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we'll go to KPD World Boards. Okay. Yes. We'll move on. We're done with the budget. I uh, just wanted to let you guys know we wrapped up the oral boards for uh, Sergeant and Lieutenant for Miss E. She sat in those all day the last two days, but uh, she said that it uh, sounds like everyone did very well. Um, the Sergeant written exam was given a few weeks ago. Um, everyone passed. Uh, same with the oral boards. Uh, so that's, that's a perfect scenario. Um, where all of our candidates passed and the testing serves to rank them uh, so that they can all be given due consideration. Um, we are in the process uh, for captain. Um, that one got separated. We actually do have an ongoing grievance regarding that process, so we were trying to hold it, but we are obligated to do annual testing, so I didn't want to hold it so long that we missed our obligation to do the testing. So we're just really trying to muddle through that one without violating any piece of either of those processes. So we have gone ahead and posted for captain. Um, that will have an oral board as well. Um, and I'm going to guess probably will be sometime up into September um, for that process. Uh, for, and that will conclude all of the supervisory testing for the police department that we're required to do for 2024. Um, Fire, uh, we are reviewing their exams, as I said. They, I, I didn't put that on here, but they will be doing their annual testing as well once we get those exams updated. Um, oral board update is the process I mentioned to you with the budget conversation that we are actually creating new oral board questions, uh, including a bank of additional questions to trade those out each year and make the exam slightly different from year to year. Um, we have a meeting with the um, standard who is our consultant uh, and the subject matter experts at KPD that is going to be uh, next week and that really is to get the subject matter experts input on what's important what you know it's not as an oral board question is not as strict as developing uh, written exam questions they're more looking at what are priorities what are the key knowledge, skills, and abilities that this person needs, but also culture. You know, what things do we need to be looking at? Attitudes, culture, anything that can be built into those questions to help qualify those individuals. So uh, they're doing that meeting next week, and I think after that, the uh, consultant then goes back and works on the items. I don't know if there's a lot of extra work that uh, KPD or we have to do on our side. So that should be the next step in that process. I expect that to be a faster process than we're used to with creating new exams. Um, and just to update, I'm trying, I'm keeping you updated. I've added this just because we've seen so much more activity on hearings. I want to keep you aware of, of what we have active. Right now we do have two active. Um, and when I say active, that's going to be something that's at, at the hearing level. Um, so once I report it to you, it's at the hearing level. Grievances go through several steps that don't involve us. Uh, before they get to that level. So when I report it to you, it's at the step three hearing level. Um, and we do have two active grievances and two active disciplinary appeals right now. We still have one pending in the change report. I actually think we are, we are potentially going to have a second appeal to change report. We have not received it yet. We have, we have had inquiries, so we're kind of, so there could be a second appeal. Uh, in Chancellor, but we'll, we'll update you on that and we can that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I guess in charge of the Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be brief and just talk a little bit um, about the subjects that I have. The first one is benchmarking. Every year, as a result of our um, compensation study, we, in between the actual compensation study and the next compensation study, we look at benchmarking. So all non-uniform positions are open for consideration based on if they believe that the positions are not correctly um, in the correct pace grade. So what we're doing, all of our HR generalists have reached out to the departments to see if there are any positions that need to be updated and we're waiting to start that benchmarking marking process. 
we'll be working with MTAS on that as well. Last year, the uh, police department did a modified small compensation study that looked at recruitment and retention. And, and so this year, the fire department will have a very similar process where we will look at recruitment, retention, and compression. And so we're getting ready to start that process in the next few weeks as well. I also wanted to let you know about a little bit of information that's been updated with the HR metrics. We've reported some information to the mayor and to the chief of staff as well about some of those metrics and things that we've done over the years. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit of information. We looked at, um, we pay attention to a lot of different metrics. We look at turnover rates for the year, and we measured this between 7-1 through um, 2020 through, through 630, 2024, our fiscal year. So we look at performance evaluations, we look at turnover, we look at um, what people say, education, tuition reimbursement, those types of things. This morning I met with the police, excuse me, with the fire chief, and we were talking about something that we end that they put in in this new fiscal year, which was a bonus um, structure in place for advanced e a advanced EMTs and paramedics. As a result of putting that in, there are 37 new advanced EMT individuals coming on from July 1 to now. So looking at some of these things, and we have, I think he told me, four new paramedics. Guys, this is a big deal for the fire department. So as we look at this as well, we look at tuition reimbursement. In the past year, for that past fiscal year, we had over 327 hires and we had 274 separations. Now we break this down voluntary and involuntary as well, but I wanted to let you know when we look at this, out of the 274 separations that we had in the last fiscal year, 100 of those or 45% of those came from the police department alone. And when we look at this, we break this down by civilians and by uniform. So we give a lot of data to the mayor about what's happening. We look at um, exit interviews, we look at different things, training and those types of things. And we have it broken down for the fiscal year. But I wanted to just share a little bit of that data with you as well. In addition, we are starting something called Power Hour. And it is something as, that's resulting out of the supervisory training. Last month, I talked to you a little bit about the supervisory training and the things that we've done. And last month, in the month of June, we had, maybe I didn't talk to you last month because I don't know if we had it, but anyway, in the month of June, our supervisory training had 54 individuals. This is the largest number that we've had. Amazing number. As a result of that, we were doing a, what we call now a power hour. Originally, we were doing it during lunch, but moving forward, we're doing a power hour around that nine or 10 o'clock time so people can still take their lunch and we will follow up. Our last Lunch and Learn was about this idea of the five generations in the workplace. So I wanted to let you know about that as well. Looking forward to the one after. In September, we will have September 26th, our next supervisory training and it will deal with DISC personality inventories and performance. So we're excited about that as well. Um, I'm going to go to Title VI updates first and then I'll end with the position updates. Title VI updates, we are looking through Title VI and Title VII. Uh, we have, are going to reactivate our internal equity committee. Just worked with Lakenya Middlebrook and their team, Lakenya, excuse me, Tiffany Davidson is going to co-help with this. I don't know, co-director, whatever that title is. And we're going to be looking at what do we need to do from surveys? What does internal equity look like for ensuring that we're working within this avenue of equity in the workplace? So we're very excited about that. More information to come. Last but not least, we're getting ready to hire our deputy director. That is on the agenda today. So I'm very excited that we hopefully will get a deputy director. We did not realize, and, and Vicki uh, told us that, hey, we've got to come before you all. Thank goodness that she said that, so thank you so much, that we needed to bring this back before you all to ask for the exemption 
for a deputy director. Never occurred to me, why would we have to ask for an exemption? So we're, I'm going to bring it back before you all at some time in the future to say that deputy directors, this should be an automatic exemption. But right now we're bringing that back before you all so we can hire a deputy director that will be working with some strategic aspects, but also will be working directly with our HR generalists and working on building some of this um, information there. So before I come back next month, um, I will be speaking at the National PASHRA, which is the Public Human Resources Association. I will be doing a presentation talking about succession planning and how do you build the best workforce. So I'm very excited to be on a national stage and I'll be doing that before we come back. So I'll be glad to share that with you all when I come back. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I got two yes, questions. sir. You said recruitment, retention, and compression. Yes. What's compression? Compression is when you look at uh, promotions and one rank is so close to the other that the their pay grades are very compressed. So, for example, if I um, am a firefighter and it doesn't happen in firefighter, I'm using the basic ranks, it doesn't happen there. But I'm a firefighter and then I've been there at a period of time and I've been there and I am so close to the senior firefighter. Again, this is an example. This does right. not happen for firefighters that's listening. Does not happen. <laughs> this is an example. But somebody could say that. But the, it, what happens is that because they've been there time and rank, that they're so close that they that their pay is so close in rank. And that's right. called compression. And from an HR standpoint, we look at this to determine red, green, and, and where are we in this, and how do you fix it? The only way you can absolutely 100% fix it is that one pay grade ends, the top of that pay grade ends completely with the beginning of the other pay grade. That cannot happen. We just don't have the resources or the funds. That's how you would automatically, absolutely 100% fix it. So what we need to do is look at this. In the past, um, it's something that has had to be looked at and it was a manual process. We're going to be working through our um, consultants to try to get this. When we did the MAG study originally, the fire department has much more compression, and I don't know the historical perspective. There, Vicki may be able to give a little bit more understanding of why that happened historically for the fire department. But what we're looking at, and we had to look at that with the MAG study and work through that. We knew that because you can't 100% fix it, that it's something that you have to continue to look at. So you will pay, you look at pay compression when those grades are close together. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, it does. Thank and you for asking. Second question was that the police department was 45%. Uh, has that never grown or shrunk? I, I am only looking at the data for yeah. this fiscal year. I will look, I'll ask her to pull um, I don't think she's here with us. No, but I will ask Mary Margaret Mary to um, see what we have for the past fiscal year. I did not pull that. But out of our turnover, that's 45% of our turnover was at the police department. The police department, not uniformed, but um, uniformed and civilian. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just add to the compression discussion, that's why it's somewhat misleading when you go. And we need to raise the salary of entry people, because mm -hmm. then that pushes them up closer. Right. And then immediately people say, well, wait a minute, you yeah. know, I'm only making right. no more. And then they go up, well, that happens in every organization, yeah. schools, UT, whatever. <laughs> and so that's why I think it's it's always a little more costly when you once you start that and for fairness purposes mm -hmm. ends up being that way. So yeah. that's just is the reality of public budgeting. Yeah, for like no, it makes sense, but I mean, it was just a turn, I was like, okay, we threw those three together, I'm like, okay. Thank you two for three. saying that. <laughs> I, I don't think about it. It's just one of those terms that I use so much that I don't even think about. Yeah. So thank you for asking for the yeah. clarification. That's an important concept. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the report. Okay, do we have any unfinished business? Well, I guess we kind of do because we're going to call you right back up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talk about your request, which you've already given us a preview of, for your position of Deputy Director of Human Resources. Uh, Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Kelly Roman. I just want to come back up here again. We are asking for a, um, a request to exempt our Deputy Director position. This position will serve at the pleasure 
of the director and ultimately at the pleasure of the mayor. So we would like to make sure that this position is um, exempt from civil service status. As administrations change, my role could very easily change and we do not want to hinder whomever would be in that role to be in a role to not be able to pick a person that would be there. So we request, we humbly request that our deputy director is given exemption from civil service. Do have any, any questions uh, comments? This is Level. a new position. This was given to us in the budget year. The uh, mayor gave us one additional position within the HR department. Yes, sir. Well, finally, let's to follow Roberts appropriately. Do we have a motion and a second? Then we can have any discussion to follow. Motion. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, okay. Now we're at the discussion. Sorry. Any questions? Is it no, just this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, sir. It is something that was added in the fiscal year. The new fiscal year. Yes, sir. So it is a new position. We hope, based on your vote today, to be able to fill that position um, soon, <laughs> very soon. So we hope. And, so. and you had mentioned earlier that there's prizes that require this. So typically, deputy directors don't require or exempt already. Going to refer to this. Oh, yeah, I there you say, go. <laughs> yes, I'm going to say. I don't know why. The colorful history of yeah, the deputy director. Um, history. So it's under different. the the charter, when the charter was drafted as written, deputy directors were covered by civil service. They were classified. They were not included in the charter list of automatically unclassified positions because at that time, apparently, the preference was for them to be classified maybe for continuity of operations I don't know that was quite a long time ago um, so at the time the current charter was implemented it did not include deputy directors in that list um, however over time certain directors started wanting they, they felt the need for an unclassified deputy director and there were I'm, I can't remember the first two there were two initially. I, I want to say it was one at the police department, maybe the public service department um, back in the 80s for, were the first ones to bring their request before the board and that would fall under that provision that it's um, a position of a policy making nature. Right, so it, it fits the definition for the ones that the board can exempt, although they're not automatically exempt when created. So right. this board has grabbed, and they were never all exempted at once. You have piecemeal exempted every deputy director in the city. Right. So that was, each one. That was the question I was asking. As that, everyone has yes, been. They were, that when I became director, it was about 50 50. About 50% 50 were uh, classified, and about 50% were not classified. And at that time, we just had a general discussion. It just felt awkward to me as a new director with you know advising the board to have half of our deputy directors for civil service and half were so the board had a discussion um, about that because you can see it both ways you can see continuity of operations mm -hmm. you have that one person high level that doesn't change necessarily with the change of administration but at the same time as a director you want the ability to hire the person that's going to be your right hand um, you want that discretion um, so ultimately, uh, the board ex decided to exempt with, you know, approval of those department heads to exempt the remainder. And I want to say we did the last lingering uh, deputy director positions were the last ones to go were uh, finance, engineering, and parks and recreation. Uh, those were the last three that were classified. Those were unclassified ah, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and since then, each newly created, so when a newly created deputy position comes about, it then has to be um, But all of the existing ones are currently exempted. So you only have to create new ones, uh, exempting ones. It's like the same principle of the senior executive service, service with the feds. I mean, but I'm strongly a believer of the responsiveness that you need for a director responding to the mayor to have a deputy that also is not is uh, inconsistent with the values of that department for management purposes. It gets, and there is an argument, as Vicki said, for having some continuity, but I think the general consensus has been that that's outweighed 
by the need to have somebody that's sort of on the same team carrying out the same procedures. And then it gets really awkward then, and there, there's a history of people in place of deputy directors that it doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't work out, but they have civil service protection. And anyway, but I mean, you can make, arguments have been made both ways the whole time. I, I definitely am of the opinion that they should be exempt. Yeah. What that's right. Thank any you. other any other discussion before we vote? We have a motion and a second. Motion. Yes. Oh, we got. Well, we got a motion and another motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I think we're ready for the vote. All those in favor of granting this exemption, uh, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? No. Ayes have it, and the, the request is granted. And now we're back to the and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You may proceed. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you yeah. on the broader request, Thank too. You. Okay, and again, we're anxiously awaiting the search committee yeah. update. Yeah. Okay, well, so moving forward, I mean, honestly, with the search committee, the board, you just let me know what questions you have for me, too. I'll give you an update. But any, anything I don't cover, let me know what could be helpful because. Want to make sure we're communicating anything that's pertinent back to people. So that is one of the catches of this selection community and separated out. Right. So it's definitely, I'm glad you're here to uh, catch me if I'm forget uh, something. Thank you. So we did have our first meeting uh, for the selection committee. And uh, we'll be meeting again next week. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of that with our first meeting was just kind of first meeting, laying out the ground part. What what is the purpose of this committee? Uh, and then looking to at um, some of our most important immediate needs, and that is obviously nailing down that job description. <laughs> so I know we have given input uh, from Dr. Hatfield. I've been working with. MTAS also, uh, and just recently got a, a plethora of information I'll be bringing to the next meeting. So I'll say the real uh, fun begins getting ready to dive through and cut through all of that. It's a lot. So if, to, if there's any of that that you all would like to see, just let me know. I can get it through. Vicki, let Vicki know, excuse me, backtrack, let Vicki know. <laughs> And she'll uh, get get it from you too. So um, that, that's really just the first ground part, and also like establishing who um, we need from other departments like civil service and human resources when it comes to getting the into paper on um, you know pay analysis that we're going to be looking at for all those things too. So HR, are you ready to stand by <laughs> soon? <laughs> Same for civil service whenever we need uh, any information within that too. Uh, so I would say uh, our real work starts now uh, after coming to this next meeting with the committee and making sure that we get that um, summed up job description and thing ready to roll and it looks perfect to sell it with, quite frankly. So um, let's see here. Um, and, and we do know the, about the, the one uh, area of duties we need is somebody with a personnel background. Now, I know that's nice, right? Like you get, that's <laughs> all the guidance the chair gives you. <laughs> but um, so we are, uh, we have just some feedback too that, you know, we don't want to limit our search with over qualifying, you know, master's degree, et cetera. Like, just I'm not saying we wouldn't want to do that, but we don't want to narrow out anybody that could be an exceptional fit for that position otherwise. Um, and then let's see, well, you know, obviously view that having that background in personnel <laughs> is, is very important. So uh, we want to look for somebody too that um, has really continued to going to build on the modernization that you brought in the department, like with the testing. I hear really good feedback. Uh, from departments about that. So 
Uh, we're going in the right direction there, and we want somebody who's definitely going to keep building on that part of it. Is, uh, like I say, kind of the main uh, point that I hear from outside to what they find is that important for city council employees and getting great people in here. So. Anything else? Any questions? Thank you again for taking this on. It's a huge service. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, like I said, I think the, well, the real work uh, scouts are really smart. And we support you in that. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other business that we have? Not hearing any, do we? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Oh. <laughs> I have a motion to second. All those in favor of the jury, indicate by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.